Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Christy and today we're going to be talking about my experience in a residential treatment facility. And as a disclaimer, we're going to be talking about eating disorders. So if that's something that triggers you, just go ahead, click away now, protect yourself and your mental health. I also want to say that my experience should not in any way dictate whether or not you should go to a treatment facility. As I discussed in this video, I didn't really have a positive experience in this residential treatment facility. However, that does not mean that you shouldn't get the help that you need. And I happen to know multiple people that have been to that same treatment center that I went to and had a way better experience, had a positive experience. So just because I'm sharing my experience and it happens to be negative, that does not mean that you shouldn't seek out the help that you need or even go to a residential inpatient treatment facility if that's something that you need to do. You have to do what's best for you and everybody's different. So please just make sure that you're putting yourself first and doing what you need to do to heal and to recover. Close but we're strangers, feel like we're far apart. I'll just say this has been a really hard video to make. Even just writing out the points that I wanted to cover, I was getting really emotional and looking over it, my script earlier today, I just was on the verge of tears. So I'm really hoping that I'm able to get through this without breaking down. But you know what, if it happens, it happens. Thinking about my time in treatment, it brings up so many negative memories and emotions. And I'll obviously get into all of that, but just so you're aware, I very well made breakdown at some point during this video. So before I get into my treatment experience, I want to give you just a really quick background. In the winter of 2019, I had just come home from my university and I was home for Christmas break. My then boyfriend was visiting for the holidays and I've talked about this before. Family dynamics have not always been the best and typically when I would visit home, my eating disorder would get a lot worse. There were a lot of things going on in my personal life, even just things going on in my relationship with my boyfriend at the time, things were really stressful. I was turning more and more to really destructive eating disorder habits and things really got so bad that the beginning of the year, like the beginning of 2021, before I went back to school, I sat down with my mom and I said, I have reached rock bottom, like I need help. She was really supportive, really thankful that I had come to her and she called a local eating disorder treatment facility. I'm not gonna say which one it is, but she called this facility. They reached out to me. We had this long interview. They asked me a lot of questions and I told them what I was doing, some of my behaviors, things like that. And my goal was to get into an outpatient program with them where essentially I would be having classes maybe a few times a week. I'd have more support, but I wasn't like living in their facility. And at this point when I was having the interview, I was like, I'm probably not even sick enough to do this outpatient program, but whatever, we'll see what they suggest. So I get through this interview and the person on the, on the line who's talking to me, she's like, yeah, they're not gonna accept you into outpatient. Like you have to come inpatient, you're way too sick. There's no way they're going to accept you into the outpatient program. And at this point I had literally one semester left of college before I graduated. Like I had like three and a half months before I was done with university for good. And they were essentially wanting me to take this huge chunk of time. I mean, the minimum being 30 days. And so I would have had to essentially drop out of college for a semester. And then I would have had to resume college in like the following August and finish up anyways I was I adamantly refused I was like there's no way I have three and a half months left I'm not going to drop out of college to go inpatient I I was like there's no way I'm even gonna do inpatient like that would just be miserable that would be horrible we went back and forth with the treatment center to see if there were any other options but the treatment center basically said we will not take you unless you agree to at least some time inpatient and I kind of just decided that I would give it three and a half months I would graduate and I would revisit things when I was done with school and if I'd improved great and if not then I would would reconsider going to the treatment center. So fast forward to March. <laughs> As we all know, the world kind of shut down in March of 2020 and my school shut down, sent all the students home and I was doing classes online for the last like month. And again, being at home, my boyfriend again was visiting because it was supposed to be like my spring break and he just ended up staying because I was now no longer going back to university. I was staying at home. Things in that relationship were extremely stressful. Things with my family were extremely stressful. The dynamics were just 
really triggering in so many ways. And again, I felt like I was back to rock bottom. I felt like I had no options. I was miserable. The behaviors were terrible. I was extraordinarily just depressed and anxious and everything in my life seemed to be going wrong. And again, I, I don't remember who brought it up this time, but there was a conversation that I had with, with my mom and she was really strongly encouraging me to revisit going into the treatment center doing inpatient there. And at this point, like my main concern was the cost. So my family and now me, because I pay for my own like healthcare insurance or whatever, but at the time I was on my family's plan. We as a family do not have traditional insurance. We have something termed a, well, I wrote it down cause it's kind of um, ah, a healthcare sharing ministry. So it's not insurance, it's a healthcare sharing ministry. They're a great service for many, many people, but the issue is that they don't typically cover costs related to mental health issues. And so I was like, there is no way that this healthcare sharing ministry is going to cover my time at this inpatient facility. And there's no way under the sun that I'm gonna let my parents pay for this. I can't pay for this at this point. If, if our healthcare sharing ministry is not going to cover it, there is zero chance of me going. My mom got on the phone with our healthcare sharing ministry and she talked to them, had a couple conversations with them, basically explained the whole situation. And for some reason, somehow they said, you know what, we are going to cover this. Within like a matter of days, maybe a week, maybe a week and a half, I had finished college and like two days after my last class, I was in this residential treatment facility. And in total, I was there for 30 days. So now to get into like my experience at the treatment facility, and I've kind of broken this down into three main issues that I had being there with like my whole experience. And number one, was the programming. Now I, I'm kind of hesitant to bash on the programming because I, well, I'm not bashing on it. Like I know that it works for some people. I made friends at this treatment facility and they had a positive experience. They thought all the programming was very applicable to them and they learned a lot. But for me, I had a really hard time grasping the logic behind a lot of the programming. I went from being very active. I was in school full time. I was working and I had other projects going. I was helping out at my parents, um, property and I you know I was dealing with my relationship because my boyfriend was was visiting there was so much going on and I went from all of that to essentially just sitting on a couch for 30 days that was extremely hard and you know some people say that's part of the process you know my counselors would tell me hey it's just it's part of the process you have to learn to be still and in some respects I understand that like I I do and I do know how to be still, but for 30 days, I was just sitting on the couch. I was sitting in these group therapy sessions. There was just so little movement, so little happening, not even just physically. I felt like I wasn't intellectually challenged at all. And that's something that's really important to me. And that makes me happy when I'm learning new things and kind of growing as a person. But while I was there, I, I read a bunch of books in my downtime and I, I tried to make the most of each situation, but the programming I just felt was lacking for me personally. I think it was designed for a very specific specific type of person. And we do these classes like art therapy, or we'd spend so many hours just like lying on the floor for random yoga sessions. I realize it sounds like I have a really bad attitude, but at the time I was really trying to get as much as I could out of the programming. I'm like lying on the floor on my yoga mat, listening to like, not bells, whatever those, those bowls that ring or whatever. And I'm like, okay, what, like, what can I gain from this experience? What can I learn? So I did try to have a positive attitude, but after, you know, four weeks of this, I felt like I wasn't gaining anything. I didn't feel like there were a lot of practical tools that were being given to me to help me through recovery. I honestly felt like it wasn't worth my time. Like I felt like I had just wasted 30 days. I will say like some programming was okay. I really, my counselor was really good. I had good conversations with her, but 95% of the time our sessions were group sessions. So with everyone, there was very limited time that I like actually got to talk with my counselor. The other class that I did enjoy was cognitive behavioral therapy. I was able to relate to that. I thought some of that stuff was very interesting, but honestly, I didn't feel like I learned a lot at the treatment center. And in the back of my mind, I was just thinking, you know, someone's paying thousands and thousands of dollars for me to be here. I'm not getting anything out of this. And I was just miserable and I wanted to do more. And I was constantly being just told to like sit still and, and, you know, not do anything and to be okay with that. And, you know, again, I like, I understand the logic, but for 30 days, 
days. It was just extremely rough. Another thing is like, I was pushed really hard to go to treatment. I was very hesitant about it. Like it was my decision, but it was definitely pushed on me. And I think in some respects, I just wasn't ready. And the fact is, if you're not ready, you're not ready. And it doesn't matter how good the programming is. If you're not 100% ready, like it's not going to be as beneficial to you. And you're probably not gonna get that much out of it as if you were ready. I will say like, I put in a good faith effort. I did try, I tried to gain value from everything that was being taught to me. I just really, really struggled. And so for those 30 days, I was just low key, just depressed and miserable because I wasn't doing anything. I felt like I wasn't learning. I wasn't growing. I felt like I wasn't getting any better at all. The second issue that I had, and this is gonna sound really weird. So I'm gonna elaborate and I, I'm honestly struggling with how to phrase this, but not censorship, but like there were a lot of things that we couldn't talk about. And I felt like almost everything was really shallow. And I recognize that there are some things that you can't say. I mean, when you're recovering, there are a lot of really triggering topics. You know, we were very cognizant in the treatment center and I'm very cognizant today personally, not to mention anything with numbers because that can be really triggering. It's really easy to compare yourself to others, especially when numbers are involved. So I recognize some of the guidelines, you know, it was encouraged that we didn't talk about numbers. It was encouraged that we didn't go into specific details about stuff. Totally understand that. However, there was one girl and for some reason, she hated me. I feel like I get along with most people, but she for some reason did not like me at all. Like she was constantly talking about me behind my back to the other girls. And I know this because I got along with everyone else and they'd tell me, they'd be like, yeah, do you realize that she's saying, I'm like, yeah, she's not very subtle about it. Like she's talking about it on the other side of the room. I can hear her. I don't really know what, you know, I don't know why she hates me so much. Other people would tell me, they're like, yeah, you've kept your side of the road clean. We don't really know what's going on. And at this point, you know, I had bigger fish to fry. Like I wasn't really concerned about this one girl. I'm like, she can talk about me all she wants. That's not why I'm here. Like I'm not here to have this drama. I'm here to get better. But this one girl for some reason would get really offended by anything that I said. And so we'd have these sessions. I remember one time our counselor counselors like gave us these pictures and we had to like talk about what we were seeing. And so this girl said what she had been seeing. And then I saw, I, I said what I had been seeing. And she later like is complaining to me and her counselor, like they pull me in, into this session. She's just like, well, you know, I just felt so degraded. Like, how could you say something like that? Like you just were belittling my opinions. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, are you serious? I didn't say anything about you at all. I was just answering the question like when it came to like my my thoughts about these freaking pictures that no one cares about. No, I didn't say that. I was very nice about it, but it was just this constant weird dynamic and she would get really offended. There was another time we were all outside and I was just trying to let off some steam. And so I was walking back and forth on this trail. She was like far away sitting on a log with one of her friends. And I find out later she is again complaining to me and her counselor and my counselor. She's like, well, when Chrissy was like walking back and forth, she seemed so aggressive. She was just reminding me of all this trauma in my life. And I'm like, at that point, I didn't really know what to say. Like, you know, I'm sorry that me just existing is driving you up the wall. But again, at this point, you know, I was a few weeks into my stay and I just really couldn't be bothered to care what she thought of me like that. I didn't know what I had done wrong, but I was always very cognizant of being kind to her and respectful. I will say there was one time at the very beginning of treatment, this was like my first weekend. We did have a bit of a spat, I guess you could say. And I apologize for it. I did say some unkind things. She said some unkind things, but I apologized. We both moved on from that. Other than that, I was very kind to her. I never talked poorly about her behind her back and I never complained about her to, to anyone. And so I really, I don't know what her problem was, but her presence in this facility genuinely made it really challenging to even be honest with things that were going on. Like it was almost as if everyone had to cater to her really specific needs. And I realized this is probably an, an unpopular opinion, especially this day and age where everyone's getting canceled for having an opinion. But I personally believe that it's not my responsibility to go through life, making sure that I don't offend a single person. In my opinion, if you go through life and you never offend anyone, you're probably doing something wrong. And that in no way means that you need to be rude, disrespectful or unkind or needlessly offensive in any way at all. And I can say like hundred percent, I was not those things to her, but for some reason, like my very presence just offended her. And so everyone was almost like walking around 
around eggshells around her. And I also remember this other girl, really sweet girl, came into the treatment center a few weeks after I did. And she even in one of the group sessions asked the counselors was like, hey, I don't even know what I'm allowed to talk about here. Like, I feel like there's these deep issues that we need to talk about and we can't even talk about them. I felt like it was very shallow in some respects. I felt like I wasn't able to speak my truth. And as much as this one girl that really didn't like me, you know, as much as I tried not to think about it and I didn't engage and I just was like, you know what? I, again, I have bigger things to focus on than this one person that genuinely hates me for some reason. Towards the end, like it got really draining. I mean, she started calling me out in front of the entire, like the staff, all the residents there. There was one time that she was like genuinely just calling me out for something that was insane. Looking back, I really wish that I had stood up for myself because the things that she was saying was genuinely like not true at all. And yet I, I was kind of at my breaking point and I sort of just like rolled over and took it and apologized. And boy, if I could change anything, I would go back and speak my truth and not apologize because I didn't have anything to apologize for. And so I felt like week after week, I was just kind of being broken down and becoming like less of a person. And it, it was just, everything seemed very shallow to me. Now, number three is probably the hardest thing to talk about. And that is dishonesty. I don't know what else to call it because it was dishonest. I don't know how intentional it was between the parties, but let me just explain. So about three or three and a half weeks into my stay in this residential treatment center, my mom calls me and she basically says, so our healthcare sharing ministry has decided that they will not cover your stay. And whether or not my parents knew that this was coming. I'm suspicious that they knew or at least figured that it wasn't going to be covered even a week or two before they told me and they just didn't wanna tell me. I can't confirm that. I, I think they didn't wanna tell me though because they knew I would leave. So she tells me they're not gonna cover anything mental health related. However, since the treatment center promised we have this in writing, they said we will itemize all your expenses, our not insurance or healthcare sharing ministry said that they would cover anything medical related. And that included like the doctor coming to visit the resident. And he came like once or twice a week and blood work that needed to be done. And even the dietitian and medications and, and all these things. So they would have covered a significant portion of this cost. But again, I was still really upset that the insurance wasn't going to cover, or not insurance, our healthcare sharing ministry wasn't going to cover the whole stay like they had said. And so that very night I signed the paper saying that I was going to leave leave against advice and I was gonna leave the next morning because it was kind of late at night. I packed up everything. The next morning I was ready for my mom to come pick me up. At this point, my counselors and everyone there was trying to convince me to stay and I was like, hell no. My parent, like this is already costing thousands of dollars. I can't, like I was so upset. I mean, I like cried that whole night. I was just miserable and angry. I couldn't believe this was happening. This was like my worst fear. And I was like, there is no way I'm gonna stay another hour. Like I am leaving. The finance committee has a lot of calls with my mom mom and there's a lot of stuff happening and my mom was supposed to come like sometime later in that morning when the head person from finance and my counselor pull me aside and they're like so Christy we have decided the treatment center has decided to give you I want to say it was like five days or seven days for free they're like you can stay here for free no costs whatsoever we want you to stay here in my mind I'm like that's ridiculous these things don't happen you just don't give stuff away for free and so I'm asking all these questions I'm like what is the catch there's got to be some cash. You don't just give five to seven days of treatment away for free. There's something fishy about this. Like, why would you just give me this time for free? They're like, well, you know, we really believe that you need more time and you've made so much progress, which I don't know how true that was. But anyways, they're like, you've made so much progress. We think you just need this last like little bit of time. And we really want you to be here. And they were presenting it as like out of the goodness of our hearts, we we're going to give you this time for free. After I was like, okay, you guys promise me, like you're telling me that there is no catch. You're just giving this to me out of the goodness of your hearts because you think I need it, I would be a fool to say no. And at this point, I was kind of frustrated that this was being offered to me because I felt obligated to take it because it's like three days getting treatment. But I was so miserable. I just wanted to leave. Like I just wanted to go home, but I was like, okay, I suppose I can survive like five more days or seven more days, whatever it was. Fast forward to the end of my time. I'm there for the full 30 days. My mom comes and picks me up. And literally like one of the first things that she says to me, oh yeah, so the treatment center, will not itemize any expenses. So our healthcare sharing ministry cannot pay for anything. So it's 100% gonna be out of our pocket. And I was like, what the f 
why didn't you tell me that? I was like, the reason that they gave me these five or seven days for free is because they realized that they totally screwed up. When when did you figure this out? And they, they had figured it out, like whenever it was, it was before they offered me this time. And so they 100% offered me this time because they realized how much that they'd screwed up. And I was like, mom, why didn't you tell me that? I was like, if I had known that, I would have left when I was originally gonna leave. And we would have demanded that they refund us for that week. Like they messed up. We have it in writing where they say, we will we will itemize all of these expenses. You know, that was them screwing up and we could have demanded a refund. And now they've just given me this time for free. I was like, why, why didn't you tell me? This was not a decision that I made with all the information. I was so pissed off because it was, it was dishonesty. I felt like from my parents, my parents did not tell me because they knew that I would have left. And the treatment center for some reason did not feel whatsoever inclined to tell me the actual situation. And we're just passing this off as them being gracious and, and good and whatever. And just like giving me such a great deal and being so nice when really they were covering their asses because they screwed up so bad. As you can tell, I'm like really, really frustrated about this because as much as I'm thankful that my parents were willing to put forth that money, it was a sacrifice that I never would have allowed them to make because like, I didn't want that. The reality is like, if I had known everything was coming out of pocket, I would have left after the first week. The treatment experience was so negative and there were so many negative things happening and I wasn't gaining anything from it. I, I would have left. And so I feel like in so many ways, it was a wasted investment on their part. It was a wasted time investment on my part. And just the, just the dishonesty was really like, you know, that wasn't my decision. Like I couldn't make that decision because you guys didn't tell me all of the facts. Shortly after I left treatment, I wrote a long letter to, I don't remember, one of the head people of the facility. And I was like, do you realize like everything that you guys did? I mean, you were dishonest and you guys owe us a refund because like you owe us a significant percentage of a refund because you promised that these would be itemized expenses. And you know, I had all the documentation there showed her. We had a call, I had a call with this individual and she took my notes and she's like, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of messed up. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm going to report you to the Better Business Bureau. I'm going to write a scathing review online. I, I was really upset. I mean, I was respectful about it, but I was like, you guys really screwed up. And to be completely honest, you owe us a bit of a refund. And I didn't know how far to push it. They ended up dropping like the last payment that my parents owed, which was very minimal. Like it wasn't much at all, but they ended up dropping that. And I was like, I feel like I should push more, but I was just afraid to make a bigger deal about it. And so I didn't. And I also regret that. I think that's the main reason that I have such a bitter taste in my mouth about this because having the ability to make these decisions for myself is very important to me. And I felt like in many respects that was taken away just by the dishonesty. And I realized that some of it honestly wasn't intentional. Like I don't think the treatment facility meant to mislead us. And I don't think our healthcare sharing ministry meant to mislead us. But I do think at some point, like once the mistakes were made, there was a decision to not share that information with me. And I, I have felt so bad about this for, for so long. And clearly I still do, like I'm crying right now. Like my parents made such a huge sacrifice for me, but it was a sacrifice that like I never would have accepted. Like really, I, I didn't, I did not want that sacrifice from them. And I felt so much guilt and so much, like just so much guilt around this for months. Like it took months for me to get over it and to not even be thinking about it every single day because I was just so upset about everything. And like my experience was so poor. Okay, like if my experience had been positive, at least I would have felt like I'd gained something, but I felt like I didn't have anything to show for this massive investment that my parents had put into me. And I was still sick. I was still struggling and I was still miserable. And it was like, this was just a perfectly worthless investment. I'm getting really emotional just because I now feel like I owe this huge debt to my parents and one day I will repay it. Like I truly believe when I'm in a better position, I want to repay it in some way to them. But the whole situation and even like comments from this one girl that I was telling you about that didn't like me as much as I like didn't focus on it at the time because I was really focused on trying to get the most from the programming and to recover as much as I could. After I left all these things that she said and even just calling me out in front of everyone for something that was was really crazy. It was all coming, it was all coming back to me and it was like getting to me and I was just really struggling. And anyways, I've, I've mostly moved on. I mean, I don't think about this experience. I don't really talk about it with anyone because it's just hard to share everything that happened and it makes me seem really ungrateful. And I'm not in any way trying to be ungrateful because like I'm thankful that my parents were in the position to pay for that and I'm thankful that they were willing to do it, but like it's not something that I wanted. And I I don't know, maybe I maybe I sound like such a jerk saying that, but that's just why I had such a negative.
negative experience. Like those three things, the programming, the weird like shallowness, the, the inability to talk about serious things. And then also the dishonesty around the whole situation and feeling like my choice was really taken away from me because people weren't honest with me. All that is to say that was my experience. Again, like I made friends at that treatment facility that I still talk to and I know that they had positive experiences. And I think that most of the staff there genuinely cared about the residents and they wanted what was best for the residents and they were really caring and good hearted. So I'm not bashing on all treatment centers. I'm not bashing on residential inpatient. I feel like I'm really upset now. I'm, I'm okay. Like it was almost a year ago at this point. I mean, actually almost, almost exactly a year ago in like a couple weeks. And I've, I've moved on. It's not something that I think about anymore. And you know, it's all part of like the growing process. These challenges have made me who I am today. So I'm thankful for that. I'm gonna stop rambling. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I really appreciate it. Like it honestly means a lot to me. And I'm sorry if you're struggling, like if you need help, you deserve help and you need to do what's best for you, okay? It doesn't matter what my experience has been or what anyone else's experience has been, you need to do what's best for you, take care of yourself. And if you enjoy this content, <laughs> most of my content where I'm not like crying or like getting upset, whatever. Subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram at Christie's underscore day, and I'll see you in the next video.